When Agatha Christie adapted her mystery novel, Five Little Pigs, into a stage play, retitled Go Back for Murder, she specified that the actress who plays the character Carla must also play Carla's mother in the flashback scenes. This makes for some evocative moments in the play. But this isn't the adaptation I'm going to talk about today. This holiday season, I finally get to discuss my favorite Poirot adaptation, which also happens to be based on my favorite Christie book, Hercule Poirot's Christmas. Why then did I start by talking about a different story? I'll explain later. Hercule Poirot's Christmas, also titled Murder for Christmas and A Holiday for Murder, was first published in December 1938. It was adapted for the TV series Agatha Christie's Poirot, starring David Suchet, in 1994. Let's dive in. The story begins a few days before Christmas and introduces us to the various members of the Lee family. The patriarch is Simeon Lee, a rich, nasty old man. He has four sons, Alfred, George, David, and Harry. Although Simeon likes to make people uncomfortable by bragging that he probably has illegitimate sons all over the world. Alfred is the loyal son, so he and his wife Lydia live with Simeon. George is a member of Parliament. He and his wife Magdalena keep on good terms with Simeon in order to stay wealthy. David is the son who's loyal to his mother, who is deceased. He resents Simeon for mistreating her, but his wife, Hilda, convinces David to accept Simeon's invitation in hopes that they can bury the hatchet. Harry also had a falling out with Simeon. This will be the first time they've spoken in years. Two other people are on their way to Simeon's home. Pilar Estravados, his granddaughter, and Stephen Farr, the son of Ebenezer Farr, Simeon's old partner. Stephen and Pilar meet on a train and become friendly. One by one, the family members arrive and the tension thickens. Simeon is entertained by this and even encourages his son's resentment toward each other by announcing that Harry and Pilar are going to move in. There's a recurring theme among the male characters of nursing a grudge for an absurdly long time. When Stephen finally arrives, people start mistaking him for Harry Lee, and vice versa. Simeon is thrilled to have his old partner's son here, and insists Stephen stay for Christmas. You're one of the family, my boy, he says. Think of yourself as that. On Christmas Eve, Simeon gathers his family in his room and deliberately lets them overhear a staged conversation in which he lets slip that he's changing his will. When his sons protest, he flips out at them all, calling them worthless and putting them all down, except Pilar. This leaves the family members shaken. Apart from tormenting his family, Simeon's other favorite pastime is his collection of diamonds. After the blow-up, he opens the safe to take a look at them, and the next thing we know, there's a police officer at the house, Superintendent Sugden. He tells the butler he's collecting for police charity. That night, everyone hears a terrific noise from Simeon's bedroom. They all rush up, but the door is locked. They break it down and find the room in shambles, and Simeon with his throat slit. As with many Christie films, this one begins with a flashback that wasn't in the book. A young Simeon Lee and his partner, Ebenezer Farr, are prospecting in South Africa. Ebenezer possesses the diamonds until Simeon murders him and takes the diamonds for himself. Simeon is wounded, but a woman named Stella... I'm so sorry, I'm going to butcher this. Stella Dezafted nurses him back to health, for which he repays her by sleeping with her and then stealing her horses. We then jump to the quote-unquote present, and Poirot! As always, Poirot is inserted into the film from the beginning, but it's okay this time because everything he does contributes to the story and is entertaining. The heat in his flat isn't working, so he's going to freeze this Christmas, but then Simeon Lee calls him and invites him to stay at his house, claiming his life is in danger. Tell to me, if you please, Monsieur Lee, does your house have the central heating? What? Yes, of course. From here on, the film pretty much follows the book in terms of plot and character. Alfred's personality is a bit muted, but everyone else stands out. There are no flat characters here. However, three characters are missing. David, Hilda, and Stephen. Harry takes over as Pilar's romantic interest. Don't worry, it's not as icky as you think. And Alfred has taken on David's identifier as the son who's loyal to the memory of his mother, which is a little incongruous. It's hard to understand how he can be blindly loyal to his father and still say, You've no right to talk about our mother like that. When Poirot arrives, Simeon is vague about why he wanted him here. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Bien, what am I looking for? What am I listening for? You'll know when it happens. If old Simeon looks familiar, you might have seen him as this guy in Murder on the Orient Express, or this guy in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And if you are a Scottish lord, then I am Mickey Mouse! 
Two other characters who appear in the book are the butler, Tresillian, and the valet, Horbury. Film Tresillian is book accurate, but Horbury, despite other characters talking about him like he's creepy and sly, as he is in the book, is portrayed as nervous and deferential, and not really that suspicious at all. One other thing. In the book, after the blow-up scene, Hilda stays behind and tells Simeon ominously, I'm afraid for you. In the film, this doesn't happen, but as the suspects are leaving the room, you can see Lydia lingering. I have a hunch there's a deleted scene somewhere where Lydia speaks Hilda's line. In the book, Poirot happens to be visiting a friend in the police force, so he's asked to consult on the case. Superintendent Sugden explains how he happened to be on the scene when the murder happened. Simeon Lee had called him and reported his diamond stolen. Unfortunately, he didn't name the thief. It's discovered that although it seemed Simeon's door was locked from the inside, it was actually locked from the outside. This indicates that after murdering Simeon, the murderer left the room, locked the door, ran off, and then joined the mass of people dashing toward the commotion, pretending to have heard the noise like everyone else. Sugden and Poirot eventually end up working the case together. Poirot is envious of Sugden's mustache. When they interview the suspects, all the motives quickly come to light. They boil down to three categories. The diamonds, Simeon changing his will, and just plain hatred. Poirot points out that Stephen Farr is the only stranger on the premises. Stephen invites them to look into his father's history with Simeon, promising they won't find any motive, no wrong done to Ebenezer for which his son would want revenge. The other person who seems to have no motive at all is Pilar. She had every reason to expect the wealth and diamonds to come to her anyway, and unlike everyone else, she liked Simeon. I think that when he was a young man, he must have been very handsome. Like you. The interview that interests Poirot the most is that of Tresillian, the butler, who describes a strange feeling of deja vu. Seems to be the bell rings and I go to let someone in. Doesn't matter if it's Mr. Harry or Mr. George. Superintendent Sunday. I've done all this before. Clues are abundant in this story, the challenge being to sort out the useful ones from the red herrings. Poirot finds the diamonds camouflaged among Lydia's miniature gardens. Poirot and Sugden experiment and discover that if Pilar had really been in her room at the time of the murder, then she couldn't have heard Simeon scream. Magdalena tries to cast suspicion on Pilar by telling Poirot about how she picked up something from the floor just after the murder, but Sugden caught her. Sugden shows Poirot a piece of rubber and a wooden peg. Keep them if you like. If they've got anything to do with the murder, I'll retire from the police force. Later, a balloon pops, and Pilar exclaims, It's what I picked up in Grandfather's room. He must have had a balloon too, only his was a pink one. For some reason, this seems to make Poirot anxious. Poirot's behavior, on the whole, tends to mystify the Lee family. When examining a portrait of Simeon as a young man, Poirot observes that Harry is the only Lee son who inherited his father's characteristic looks. The other sons all look like their mother. Later, Poirot mystifies them further by making what he says is an important purchase, and it's a false mustache. At one point, Lydia wishes out loud that the killer be a stranger and not a member of the family. It might be both. It might be a member of the family and at the same time a stranger. After some drama involving the will, Pilar is almost killed by a booby trap. By a stroke of luck, it doesn't work. Finally, she admits she wasn't really in her room at the time of the murder. She saw someone approaching Simeon's room just before the scream. I do not know who it was. It was a woman. This fits in with an opinion expressed earlier that Simeon could only have put up a struggle against a female killer, as evidenced by the state of his room, but seems to conflict with the discovery just made by Sugden that Ebenezer Farr's son is dead. Stephen is an imposter. The first thing that's different in this part of the film is that in the book the murder weapon was nowhere to be found, whereas here it's lying by the body. Other big changes include Poirot bringing Inspector Jap into the case by rescuing him from his Welsh in-laws, <laughs> the discovery of the empty diamond box in George and Magdalena's room, a mysterious old woman staying at the inn nearby, who later turns out to be Stella de... de from South Africa, and replacing the booby trap meant for Pilar with something much more practical.
Getting into the nitpicky details, when Simeon calls Poirot on the phone, he says Poirot was recommended to him by Superintendent Sugden, but Sugden says he didn't, adding further mystery to why Simeon wanted Poirot there. Since Jap gave Poirot a Christmas present, Poirot decides to get one for Jap and goes shopping, leading to a funny scene and some extra clues. When the police find the diamond box, the constable is very meticulous about not leaving fingerprints. And then the sergeant just prints all over it. There's also a change involving the items picked up by Pilar, but I'll go into that later. Last of all, the scene where the lawyer reads out the will is another example of a likely inspiration for the Frank Gauze scene in Knives Out. Poirot gathers the suspects for the denouement. <sighs> I'm so tempted to go over every detail of the solution. This is one of the best Poirot summations in the series. I'll stick to the bare bones here, but I urge you to go read the book and enjoy the whole thing. Not only is Stephen an imposter, but so is Pilar. The real Pilar was killed in the Spanish Civil War. Poirot had figured this out because while both Pilar's parents' eyes were blue, this woman's are brown. The person she saw outside Simeon's door turns out to be Hilda, who claims that she heard the noises within the room, but no one came out before the door was broken into. Poirot explains how the whole murder scene was staged to make it appear that the killer was someone weak instead of strong. The murderer, he says, was Simeon's illegitimate son, which Stephen confesses he is. But he's not the killer! Among the many instances of Harry and Stephen being mistaken for one another, there were a few times when Sugden was mistaken for one of them. Yes, that's right, Sugden. That's why Tresillian was so confused. He answered the door to three guys who all looked like their father. It was harder to spot with Sugden because, unlike the others, he had a mustache. Poirot made sure of the resemblance by putting a false mustache on Simeon's portrait. Pilar had come close to this realization, too. Fortunately, Sugden's attempt to kill her failed. A lot of Agatha Christie books end just after the solution, but in this one we get a nice kind of curtain call for all the characters. Pilar and Stephen get married, and everyone else, apart from the greedy jerks, finds stability and happiness. The film denouement leaves out several details, of course, but the amount it retains is quite impressive. I especially like that they kept Poirot's idea that Alfred and Harry's rivalry might really be a sham, and that they were accomplices in the murder. Two clues in the book that implicated Sugden were a. the fact that he didn't mention taking items from Pilar, and b. that he'd swapped the balloon fragment for a different piece of rubber, so we didn't know it was a balloon fragment till she mentioned it later. In the film, since Poirot sees Sugden take the items from Pilar, both these clues are left out. There are two other clues Poirot brings up in the film solution. One, that Simeon passed on to his son the ability to wait years to exact his revenge. And two, that Harry compared Simeon's dying scream to the killing of a pig. These clues were in the book, but weren't mentioned in the film prior to this. The dying screams of Simeon Lee, the cry of a man in mortal agony, huh? a soul in hell. We didn't hear anyone describe the scream. Were these more deleted scenes? The screenwriter takes a risk by interrupting the solution to have all the suspects get dressed up and go see Stella at the inn nearby. Stella is revealed to be Sugden's mother. But it works in that it makes her son's motive for murder a little less vague. You instilled into your son your own rage. I saved Simeon Lee's life and he deserted me and my child. At the last minute, the film attempts to explain why Sugden induced Simeon to bring Poirot to his house. It's not very watertight, but we don't care because we're too amused by Jap's utter confusion. Poirot gives Jap some Jamaican cigars for Christmas and thanks him for the handmade mittens, which, upon unwrapping, he tried to re-wrap, which is priceless. You're not going to wear them now, then? No one, I mean, this must be kept for best, huh? I shall wear the money when I go to church. Yeah, bull. Well, that about wraps up the comparison, but there's one more thing I want to discuss with regard to future adaptations of this novel. Fingers crossed. Generally speaking, the big clue in the mystery is... All of the men in the Lee family have a likeness that he's most strong. <laughs> 
No. I am in love with this film, and admittedly my vision isn't that good, but I am not picking up on any familial traits here. At the very least, Harry should bear a resemblance to Sugden, and that portrait should literally be Sugden sans mustache. Heck, if they do the flashback gimmick again, young Simeon should be played by the same actor as Sugden, following the example of Go Back for Murder. And if they include Stephen, as I think they should, as he's the perfect red herring, his actor needs to look similar too. The challenge is, where are you going to get three actors who resemble each other closely enough and not let their casting give away the solution? One possible trio that comes to my mind is the Hemsworth brothers. Chris could play Harry, Liam could play Stephen, since he's younger, and prior to writing the script, I didn't know that Luke existed, so assuming that the rest of the world is as much living under a rock as I am, he'd be ideal to play Sugden. What do you guys think? This will be my last video of the year, so thank you all again for your support and kind words. Next spring, I'm directing Agatha Christie's The Unexpected Guest at the local theater, so I'm not sure exactly when I'll be back, but I will be. Have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I'll see you in the new year. Blessed be.